Hello and welcome to our first video lesson on Chapter 11, Carbohydrates. In this chapter, we consider one of the four fundamental types of biological molecules that we reviewed initially in Chapter 1. Much of this chapter will probably seem like a review of organic chemistry. It's important that we review this subject now since we are beginning our studies of metabolism and our first studies will be regarding carbohydrate metabolism. In this lesson, we will review how we can classify carbohydrates according to chemical structure and composition. The general formula for a carbohydrate is to have three or more copies of the general formula CH2O. In fact, that's where the name comes from, hydrates of carbon. Although it isn't strictly true, we don't have a string of carbon atoms to which we've attached water. Instead, we have a carbon atom bound to both a hydrogen and an OH group. They're also called saccharides, and one way we can classify them is how many units are present in the molecule. A monosaccharide only has one unit, a disaccharide would have two, trisaccharide would have three, and so forth. If they're a medium-sized polymer, we call it an oligosaccharide, but for larger polymers, we call them polysaccharides. We can also modify that general formula to include other groups that would contain nitrogen, phosphorus, and so forth, and so we might have atoms other than simply carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in our carbohydrates, as we'll see. The simplest has three carbons. We have illustrated here glyceraldehyde and dihydroxyacetone. And that's one of the first ways that we can classify carbohydrates, by the nature of the functional group that carries the carbonyl. On the left we have glyceraldehyde. As you can see, the carbonyl is part of an aldehyde group. The structure for uh, an aldehyde is shown on the lower left. And so we say that glyceraldehyde is an aldose. An ose is any sugar. That's the suffix O-S-E. In the case of dihydroxyacetone, you'll notice that carbonyl group is part of a ketone. Here's the general structure for a ketone on the lower right. And so we say dihydroxyacetone is a ketose. So this is the first way we can classify them. Either they are aldoses or ketoses. We can also classify them by simply the number of carbon atoms. A triose has three carbons, tetrose four, pentose five, hexose six, and so forth. We can in, even combine those two terms as illustrated here. Ribose would be an aldopentose because it has that aldehyde group at the end and five carbon atoms. In a similar way, glucose would be an aldohexose and fructose would be a ketohexose. Notice the numbering of those carbon atoms. If it's an aldose, carbon number one carries the carbonyl group. If it's a ketose, carbon number two carries that carbonyl group. So we'll number our carbohydrates by starting at the most oxidized end, and that will be carbon number one, and then just number them down the chain. Another feature of carbohydrates is that they carry chirality. Recall that that means it has four different groups attached to at least one carbon atom. In this case, we're looking at the structure of D and L glyceraldehyde, and there's only one uh, chirocarbon in this case, carbon number two, in D-glyceraldehyde, the OH is on the right. Here it is in ball and stick model here, the oxygen in red. And that means it rotates polarized light to the right. L-glyceraldehyde on the left, the OH group is on the left here, and here it is in the ball and stick model here. And so likewise, carbohydrates can be the D or L form. Almost all monosaccharides have a number of chiral centers, and so they have a number of possible stereoisomers. But we're going to compare them by that penultimate, or next to the last carbon. In other words, look for the last chiral carbon, and you're going to compare that to L and D-glyceraldehyde. Here we have the example of D and L-glucose. D-glucose is on the left, and you'll notice that OH group in that penultimate, or next to the last carbon, the OH, in, is highlighted in yellow, it's on the right. In L-glucose, it's on the left. Notice that these are mirror images of one another, non-superimposable mirror images, and that enantiomer simply means opposite part. They're pictured here in this linear form as Fischer projections. Those Fischer projections make it pretty easy to spot enantiomers. 
and these enantiomers have identical physical properties, same melting point, boiling point, and so forth. The only way you can really distinguish them is either by how they rotate polarized light or how they interact with other substances. Even though they have similar physical properties, indeed identical physical properties, they are biologically distinct. In other words, there may be an enzyme that would bind the D sugar, but not the L sugar. And so nature can be very, very specific. Most of the naturally occurring sugars are the D enantiomer. Remember with amino acids, we found they were usually the L form. But in sugars or carbohydrates, it's the D enantiomer. We can also find, because of these multiple chiral centers, that they may be non-superimposable and not be near mirror images. And remember that term is diastereomere. There's a special case of a diastereomer in carbohydrates where they're similar around every other chiral carbon except for one, and those are called epimers. Here we have D-glucose and D-galactose. You can see similar in every other way except for that fourth carbon. The OH is on opposite sides. And so these are epimers of one another. In our next video lesson, we will see that we can represent carbohydrates in a cyclic form, a nonlinear form. We will review the principles for converting from a linear to a cyclic form in order to more properly represent their three-dimensional structure in two-dimensional space.